Okay, you should be able to see the screen. All right, I'm assuming everybody can see the screen. Let me know if you can. Okay, so we're in the home stretch now. Um, just got a few more lectures. So today we're going to do part of 11. We're not going to finish 11 today. And uh, Friday we're going to have uh, exam three, um, chapters eight, nine, and 10. Uh, that'll be Friday. Wednesday, Norfolk Southern is coming to class now. Uh, I'm going to try to make a raise to get there. Um, I may be in the wheelchair because I'm having some problems walking, but um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I'll make um, arrangements. If I can't be there, um, the, the people will still be there. Um, I posted a, a compiled lab, very simple. So all you're doing is you're doing a modified version of the Hello World. Um, no data processing. And I'm going to post another one today, maybe two today, um, that that will, one of them is going to be an inline COBOL program where you're going to have to add some data to the bottom, um, the bottom of the file where the data is. Um, you got to figure out how to do that and compile it, run it. Um, several of you didn't show me the, was it this class with the undergraduate class? I think the undergraduate class, maybe some of you didn't. Um, so what I was looking for, and I, I printed out the instructions again, just to make sure everybody um, was clear about them. I asked you to uh, modify the jobs, to modify the code that I sent you so it would run, run the code, show me the output, show me the data set. Now, a couple of people, more than a couple, uh, figured out that all they knew really needed to do was just show me the data sets, show me proof that they had created data sets, and everything else had to be done. Because I know those, I know those labs didn't have those data sets, so you had to create, them. you had to go through all the steps in the lab. That was very clever, um, and so they got full credit for that. But I need to see that you have created the data set. Don't just show me the source code. Just, just don't show me. Show me the job, execute it, create the data set. Okay. Um, so now we're going to go into Chapter Eleven, transactions. For years, I've been um, promising a kicks lab, and this semester, I still don't have one. Uh, I'm trying to get one. The labs that I've seen require you to do have a little more programming expertise with the mainframe than we cover in this class, so I, I really need a simple kicks lab, and um, I'm working with people at IBM to get one, but we're going to talk about kicks. So um, kicks is transaction. Another thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is uh, hierarchical databases. Uh, IMS, uh, Information Management System, is a hierarchical database. It's not um, relational, right? And it's lightning fast, but it's very, very complicated. Like a lot of things on the mainframe, it's very, very complicated. So we're going to talk about that too. Um, transaction managers. So by transactions, we mean things like credit card transactions, um, looking at your um, Balances, that's a transaction. Uh, the making the deposit withdrawal, that's a transaction. Purchasing a plane ticket, that's a transaction. Uh, modifying a record, that's a transaction. So that's what we mean by transaction. And you can think of transaction here in the same sense that you can think of them in your database class. Um, there really is no difference, except this is faster and handles bigger data sets than the uh, non mainframe world. So uh, what we're going to do is in, in all this chapter, um, chapter six and seven were about batch processing. Uh, chapter 11 is about online processing or transaction processing. Online and transaction are synonymous. Um, so we'll describe the role of large systems in a typical online business, list the attributes common, common to most transaction systems, explain kicks, um, and kicks is a big takeaway from this. Uh, many of you, when you get mainframe um, apprenticeships or jobs, will be uh, doing something with KICS, either writing KICS programs or, or um, providing KICS support. I have a student at um, 
um, IBM, former student, uh, Andre Clark. He was one of my first mainframe placements uh, back in the day. And I guess he's been there about 10 years now. And he is one of their leading um, kind of support people for kids. He's like, you know, the problems that, that, that and these are customers calling in. Um, they're having trouble with their kick system. And kick, kicks is the lifeblood of a lot of these companies. It's the life's blood of Bank of America, life's blood of uh, Fidelity, et cetera. So if they have a problem with kicks, they got some real problems. Uh, and he is like the, 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 the guru of support. Kicks, he loves his job. And uh, all he does is just answer questions all day. And, you know, probably 95% of the, of, the, of the questions, I'm just guessing now, but I know the percentage is high. He's answered them a thousand times, so, he, you know, it's just off the top of his head. But, you know, that five and other percent may, may require him to do some research. And that's really the fun, fun part of the job, where you, you see a problem that you uh, haven't had. And, by the way, um, I ran into a friend of mine um, by the name of John Ehrman, um, died recently. Uh, he was in his 80s. He had a long, full life. He was one of the mainframe gurus. He was a legend in the mainframe gurus. And he wrote a comprehensive thousand-page assembler uh, book that is very comprehensive. So I'm going back through that now. Hopefully, if I'm still at A&T next year, and I'm, you know, maybe I will be, maybe I won't. Who knows? But if I'm at A&T, um, definitely going to put a, a assembly class in because we need one. And you guys are ready for it. You guys are ready for it. Um, it'll be, you know, uh, a flat learning curve. But once you get an assembly class on your butt belt, you really will understand what's going on with this stuff. Um, well, so we'll talk about Kicks programs, and um, as I said, we'll discuss IMS now. So many of you have commented during the semester about how archaic the ISP, uh, ISPF interface is. I agree with you. Um, um, and but the term archaic somewhat means outdated. Um, by no means ISP is outdated because it's still very useful. But it does look kind of clunky, right? Um, and I don't really care about the look, it works. But in kicks, most kicks work goes on in some kind of a GUI environment, either web based or with some kind of a, uh, a developer tool. And um, CompuWare has been. Um, has offered to, to help us out with some software next year, again, if I'm still here. But uh, there'll be some interesting things going on next year for those of you that aren't graduating. And if you can fit another mainframe course, and there'll be some interesting things going on. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's move ahead. Um, most of this stuff we'll cover as we get to it. Um, you should be familiar with the concept of, of task or thread. Well, I don't know if you talk about threading that much in your Java class. Maybe you don't. Threading is a somewhat um, advanced topic in Java. And, um, but this is the same threading in the same context of the threads that you use in Java. Uh, don't know anything else that I would, I'm going to point to here. Oh, one of, want you to understand the difference between multi-threading and multitasking multi-threading and multitasking. I usually have a question about uh, multi-threading and multi-multitasking. So multi-threading is where you use multiple threads of the same program, right? Uh, for example, if I, if I open up Word five times, each instance that I open it up, that's a thread, right? Multitasking, I'm running different programs, right? And the processor is um, giving time slices to each one um, at the pico, picosecond rate, though because um, we're talking about 5 billion clock ticks per second. So it happens at the pico second uh, rate. So um, CSMG, that's a that's a, a kicks application that we want to talk about. So what is kicks? Um, let me make sure I get the acronym right. Well, I should be able to say that's customer information control subsystems. And, you know, there's a, there's a very kind of elaborate technical discussion that we could have about KIX not being an actual subsystem, but for all intents and purposes, it is considered a subsystem of IBM. Strictly speaking, if you talk to a guru with enough years in the game, he or she will be clear that KIX is not actually a subsystem. But for mere mortals like the rest of us, it is a subsystem. 
other subsystems we talked about this semester were Jazz and um, uh, VB2 is also a subsystem. And by subsystem, we mean something that's bolted into the operating system. It's part of the fabric of the operating system. Kix is part of the fabric of the operating system for mainframe, uh, for ZOS actually. But um, there's, you know, there's some very nuanced reasons that it's not an actual subsystem. But <clears throat> like a lot of things, if you call it a subsystem, nobody's going to chip side the head. Uh, so they give an example of travel agency, right? So we use we, we use this group at um, a t called Aladdin Travel, and um, that, that as far as I know, they're on the Saber system, which is the mainframe system, uh, one of the first main, mainframe systems actually for large commercial use, and um, they book our travel that way. As far as I know, uh, I don't know anything contrary. Um, So they've got a nice graphic here to kind of give you an idea of um, kind of what goes on real world. Um, the bottom two bullet points are changes must be immediately reflected um, to application end users. So whatever your your balance or your um, final cost, whatever it is, you need that immediately, right? You don't need to be waiting, you know, 30 seconds for that to be figured out. So you need some immediacy with it. Um, and that's the contrast with batch, batch processing because this is instantaneous. Batch kind of is you submit the job and based on the priority job, job may run now, or it may run next week. You know, it just depends on what the job is. Um, online transactions occur immediately. And so you can think of each one of these entities here, the car rental agency, the hotel, airline, um, wireless access protocol, um, an ACTP server, right? So you can think of these three top entities, hotel, car rental real agency, and airline. Each one of them having their own system, either mainframe or, or other systems. And those are all connected to the travel agent system, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, they may be all part of the same system. Probably not, but probably not. Scratch that. So the travel agent's got his, his or her system, and these other people have his, their system. So usually in the normal course of thing, there's a di direct connection between uh, the system here at the travel agents and car rental agency, et cetera, et cetera, because they're going to be doing business all day. And um, one of my areas of expertise when I was in industry was um, um, B2B, um, um, B2B processing, B2B business, business to business. Um, e-business, what they call B2B, and, uh, and there's, B, there, there's B2B, there's, there's B2C, business to consumer, there's consumer to business, there's consumer to consumer, um, but these are, these are B2B transactions here, and these terms have kind of fallen off the radar screen for some reason, still doing it, but I guess the, the activity has become so um, standardized that is, you know, the, the, the concepts have become somewhat transparent. And so, yeah, this is actually one of the, um, the slides that I really need to show you. So each one of these guys has their own system, have the travel agent, and then we have some kind of wireless access protocol, which you don't hear about too much anymore, um, connecting to the travel agent, and a web server connecting to the travel agent. So both of these may build, be built into the travel agent system. Uh, they probably going to have a web server there, uh, probably Apache, and they'll probably have some kind of wireless access protocol. Too. And then they're, as I said, they're connected to the car rental agency, the hotel, and the airline. And these systems may or may not be mainframes. Um, they probably are mainframes in, in the case of a hotel and airline. Well, case of all of them, they're, they're probably mainframes. But they don't have to be. Travel agent system is definitely a mainframe, however. Okay, so this is what... Um, is common to both mainframe and um, distributed on um, the content asset. So we're talking about transactions. For transaction, and this is something about the business of computing. So we're IT folks, and um, um, I really don't know if this is a topic that they would really kind of go into in um, comp sci or engineering, um, but it's, in, it's relevant to us because it's about the business of, of IT. So you need automicity. Now, what automicity means is 
Each transaction is broken down to its essential elements, its atomic elements. Okay, broken down to atomic. You need consistency. So the transactions need to behave the same, right? On a given system, all transactions need to be, um, their behavior needs to be consistent. Each transaction needs to be isolated, okay? So you can separate one from another and you can identify one. I think I told you that of the hundreds of millions of transactions um, in a given period, right? Um, a census programmer or a DBA can go in and identify a single transaction to review it and the technical errors, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, talking about hundreds of millions of transactions and the system keeps up with all of them individually. And it needs to be durable, right? it needs to be durable. So we need to have, um, two years from now, I need to be able to look at that data and rely on it. And again, all these concepts here, they pertain to uh, distributed relational databases, Oracle, MySQL, right? Same here, Oracle, MySQL. So there's an element of commit and rollback. So it's keeping track as you're processing the transactions, it's keeping track of it. And there's a point that you can roll back to if you need to correct any uh, errors in the data. So the system's always checking itself for erroneous data. And it has all kinds of um, bit counting things, bit sum, uh, bit summation uh, algorithm, the things it uses to make sure. For example, um, the sending system will, will tell the receiving system, I sent you X number of bits. Did you receive X number of bits? The receiving system will say yes or no. Right, that kind of stuff and it's layered in so um, um, you don't lose any of the data. That's the bottom line. The, the main the point is uh, retention of the data. Uh, multitasking, multi-threading. So multitasking is I can run multiple instances of the same program. Multi-thread, no. Multitasking is I can run um, different programs in quotes simultaneously, in quotes. Because um, we know nothing happens on the mainframe. Everything happens on the mainframe. You see. But to our eyes, it appears to be happening simultaneously. Two programs appear to be running simultaneously. Um, Multi-threading, um, using multiple instances of the same program. Um, a thread is one of those threads. Each thread uh, is identifiable and can be um, addressed and analyzed and audited separately. And reentrancy is a concept that we're going to talk about um, when we talk about um, I've got the term. Well, it'll come to me in a second. But we're going to talk about, um, and I'll, I'll remind you that that's a term I forgot. I've only been teaching this course for 12, 11, 12 years. But, um, yeah, and every semester I, I teach it. But um, um, it's, it's amazing. What you, plus, you know, I had some, some, some brain damage. So <laughs> I shouldn't laugh about it. Brain damage is pretty serious. But uh, I'm recovering from it, though. Um, really interesting is the concept that we'll come back to. Um, so when we're using online systems, we have to manage and dispatch the tasks. We have to control user access, of course, for both security and performance, right? Um, security and performance. Um, we have to manage use of memory. Um, and this is a concept. So we're at the point now where you guys should have a couple of mainframe concepts under your belt the concept of virtual memory. Um, and virtual memory is always determining what needs to be in real memory, what can be in auxiliary memory. So it's always making that determination. And then, then real memory needs to be managed so that, that uh, I'm not uh, wasting pages. I, I'm not storing data in pages. Um, and that data is, is not in a, in a reasonable period of time um, being forward to the processor for, um, for um, processing. Um, going back to the assembly book, I mean, I really am, I really love this stuff. It's, it's you know, it, it, it gets to the nuts and bolts of how computers actually work. And I think every, every, every curriculum that deals with computers should have something about assembly in there. Now, Dr. Gloucester has a microprocessor course where they talk quite a bit about um, 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 assembler, um, but that's not required. Um, I don't know if the, the, the ET students may have to take it, I don't know, but I know that IT students don't have to take it, but it's a good course to take. But assembler is really helps you understand what's going on with the machine, both the hardware 
and the software. So I really am enjoying revisiting this stuff. I'm trying to squeeze in study time for it, but um, yeah, it never it never stops. You know, your learning never stops. Um, magic manage concurrency of the data. Um, and provide device independence. So irrespective of if I'm accessing the same database, let's say my, my bank account, with my cell phone, with my laptop, with my desktop, or with my tablet, uh, that behavior should be all, all the same. It should be no different difference in the behavior um, and how, how the, de the data is vended to me. So let's talk about the characteristics of transactional systems. Um, and uh, you know, why this stuff is not, at least in, in school of business programs, uh, I don't know, because it, it should be in every, every program that deals with anything with business technology, uh, because transaction system, transactional systems are a part of all of our lives. So of course you have many users, they're better repetitive, so you do the same thing over and over. Short interaction, I, I process my credit card, I'm done in a few seconds. The data is shared, so everybody didn't have it. They're not, you know, if I got a million users, I don't have a million you know, individual data stores. I've got one data store for all those users to access. Um, the data has to have its um, integrity maintained. And of course, it has to have a low cost transact per transaction, or it will, it will be uh, economically unfeasible. So here's a two-phase commit. And um, <clears throat> you notice over here, um, or not over here, down here at the bottom, sync point, right? Um, the sync point is what you can roll back to, right? What you can roll back to. So phase one is where you um, perform the transaction. And phase two is where you commit. So it's two phase commit. And then it becomes a permanent part of the database. And you can always go back to it to audit it, but it becomes part of the database then once it's committed. Um, we'll just skip this one. So uh, customer, customer information control, and, and now they don't call it subsystem, but uh, well, they, they call it customer information control system, but sometimes you see referred to as customer information control subsystem. And it says a, it's a transactional subsystem ZOS, which uh, runs online applications, um, has, can support many users, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, that Z13 video that, that we looked at early in the term when they were talking about that, um, what were they talking about? They were talking about that, um, um, Black Friday, um, 100 Black Friday, whatever it was, that's, that's, that's kicks. That's kicks. Um, manages the integrity of the data and prioritizes execution. So this is kind of a high level of um, the system organization. You got a kicks application, and you'll see what you know what a kicks application, where a kicks application typically is um, shortly. You have the user, and you have your data here. This is a very very simplified view of what's going on. Um, you can write kicks applications in anything, and um, I was very pleased with a lot of your Rex write-ups. Um, you guys are really impressed with Rex. And matter of fact, I was I was. Um, communicating with Mike Kalashar, um, the inventor of Rex, uh, over the weekend. And um, I've not met Mike, I've met, but I've met um, his sidekick, Chip Davis. I know I've been knowing Chip for 10 years. Uh, I've not met him. Now, Mike and I may have been at the same conference or somewhere, but I, but I don't remember meeting Mike, but I know who he is. And uh, Kix, he, he, he created Quick Kix, and Kix is probably the easiest programming language, and it's very, very powerful. So. Um, your comments were very well received about um, Kicks, and we'll probably have a, uh, at least one more Kicks lab. But you can write um, Kicks applications 
Did I say one more kick slab or I meant Rex lab? One more Rex lab. Sorry. You can write Kix applications in any language, right? Because you write in the Kix environment. Kix is an environment that you develop applications in. So you can write it um, in any language. Uh, I guess if I were to pick a language that most Kix app, more Kix applications written in than others, it'd probably be COBOL. Um, but I don't have any data. That's just based on conversation. It'd be COBOL. But now a lot of them are written in Java, though. A lot of them are written in Java. So this is the process of developing a Kix application. Uh, you got your source code. Um, you, you have to it has to have go through some kind of translation or mapping. There's some mapping that goes on um, that we won't talk about because we need a we really need a lab. Uh, what you're doing, you're mapping your screen, what's on your screen. And that that information has to be um, pre-processed. And you know that there was in our compilation steps, there was something called pre-processing. Well, the kicks application, that would be pre-processing. We do kick stuff, right? Um, and then whatever comes out of that translation goes to the compiler. And from here, it's a familiar process to it. Um, we compile it in the object code. Object code is linked or bound into um, executable load modules and application runs. Voila, Kix application. So um, you have basically the same steps that you have for any system development, right? You design it, you write, you code it up, test it. Um, you define your Kix resources, map your program to those resources. Um, any other files that you need, then they'll be provided by the Kix environment. And then you let Kix know that this application is a Kix application. And you send it to the users. Um, it's a little too busy. It's not going to, without a good lab, probably not going to make any sense to you. Uh, probably same here. And this is syntax that doesn't make any sense to us because. We don't have a lab. So what we know about Kix is it is transaction driven, it's multitasking, it's multi-threading, and it's quasi-random. Now we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, let me skip ahead. Conversational, that's that's the term I forgot. Uh, let me go back here. It's quasi-random. So <laughs> There's conversational and there's pseudo conversation, and we'll talk about what they are. But quasi reentrant, what it, what happens is, well, we'll get to that part, and I'll explain to you because it's hard to explain to you out of context. Um, more detail than we need. We haven't seen any screen mapping, so that doesn't make any sense to us. Okay, we go. So conversation. Okay, so I'm an online program, right? And I like to be in person when I give this, you know, when I have this discussion, but I'm not. So uh, hopefully online, most of it will come through. Think of a phone call. So you talk to your mom. Call your mom's house. Go call your house. Well, ain't your house anymore. So, you know, when you left, they gave your room to somebody else. So um, I don't know if you're aware of that. But when they had a party, when they, when, they, when they got back to take you to school, they had a party. Um, that they didn't tell you about. Um, so you ain't going back. But anyway, call your mom, but your mom always wants to hear from you. She's glad to hear from you. And you're having a conversation. Hi, mom, how you doing? She says, honey, I'm doing well. You need some money? No, mom, I don't need any money. I know, I know better than that. You don't put the fire on your mom. Like, yeah, mom, I need $100. She probably sent it to you, mothers being mothers. But um, you go back and forth. That's conversation, right? That's conversation. Now, keep in mind that mainframes have to be maximally efficient, right? So I swipe my credit card. It opens an application, right? So let's say 
I go back to my car to get my car keys or, or lock my car or whatever. I forgot something. And I go back to my car and the program's still running. Well, it was a wasted cycle. And the mainframe doesn't play wasted cycles. It doesn't play wasted cycles. So what it does is, it's, once you swipe your card, it says, okay, I got that. And I'm waiting to get some more information. It turns the program off and it tells the process, okay, you can do other things now. If this guy, you know, don't know what he's doing, swipe his card, don't know when he's gonna be back, we're not gonna wait for him, we got, we got work to do. And it goes, the processor goes and does other things. The process goes and does other things. You push the button um, for, to put your pin in, program fires back up again. So that's quasi reentry, right? And that's pseudo conversational. You can think of pseudo conversational as like email or text. Text is probably a better, better. Uh, phone conversation, phone call, Real-time phone call is conversational. Texting is pseudo-conversation. And so that is the way that the system uh, doesn't waste cycles because the, the process is running. Whether you're doing something or not, the process is running. And the way Kix is designed, it, it, it says, okay, um, waiting, on, waiting, on, waiting on you to do something. So while, while until you do something, we're going to do, do some work. And so that's what that's what happens. So if you step through this, you'll see that process. Uh, enter account code, send the map. So the map, that's the mapping we're talking about on the screen. Then you wait, shuts down, shuts down. You receive the map, and then you say enter account one two three four. Function code does that. This is the map for that. Then it waits. And it's this back and forth of starting and stopping um, until you're done, All right? And you go through that, you'll see the process. That is what happens, that's pseudo conversation. It's the facility that, that allows the processor to go do other things um, while the Kix application is waiting on some work for it to do, it to do. And this is the general transaction flow here. Um, you can see that for yourself. No big deal. That program down here is that's a kicks program. A B C D zero one. Um, basic mapping services. So we can script. We can we can skip this. So this is what one looks like in ISPF now. Uh, probably the lab will probably be an ISPF, but most kicks is done now in uh, on the web. Most kicks development is done either web or Eclipse space. Um, but that's what it looks like. These are some codes again. They don't mean anything to us because we don't have a um, uh, we don't have a lab. This is a little bit of the JCL that starts to kick the application. Like everything else, even the kicks application starts with JCL, but then they then they remain running. So these are four forms of logic. I don't really test you on these, um, but we're talking about web enablement. Now I'm going to stop here because um, we can. Um, well, let me go ahead. Let me go ahead. So this is a little, it's a little um, graphic of kind of the environment, um, and kick stuff has been done in, in in a web environment for a long time, ever since ever since I've been teaching this. Um, yeah, you keep web server plug in to the system. Um, you have a listener up there to see what's going on, detect um, when it needs, um, something needs to happen, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of the gateway. Uh, Westphere, so we don't talk about Westphere that much. Um, yeah, we don't. 
we don't, uh, did we talk about West Friends chapter 12? I don't think we did chapter, talk about West Friends chapter 13. So yeah, West Friends is uh, an uh, application server that IBM sells. They make a lot of money on it. It's, big, it's a big product. And a lot of kick stuff is built into WebSphere. And that's another topic that can be a class by itself. These are kicks at CC and CETA, these are kicks applications. So yeah, we can get to IMS. So IMS is information management system. And although when IMS, uh, the term IMS is used, for the most part, they mean the, um, they're talking about the database, but it actually is the transaction manager and the database and the services that tie the two together, right? So there's a, tr there's a transaction manager, there's a database, IMS database, which is hierarchical, and then there's a set of services that ties them together. Um, and IMS is not really taught in the U.S. Um, I was in China seven or eight years ago, and it was taught there then. I'm sure they're still teaching it now. Um, but this is what it looks like. So these are the services, right? Transaction manager, database manager. And um, the thing about IMS is that it's lightning fast. So a lot of transactions, a lot of your credit card transactions are going to be processed on IMS databases. Now, I know one bank doesn't use IMS. BB&T doesn't use IMS, but every other bank I know uses IMS, and the stuff is not taught. So what they do is they, they usually take a DBA, um, a DB2 DBA, and turn them into an IMS person. So they they, they cross train them, um, but it's a it's a valuable skill set, and uh, I probably don't know enough to, about it to teach it. Um, probably need to take some course myself in IMS teach it. Um, and I don't know, because I haven't had anybody ask for I, IMS skills, but I know they, they need them because, you know, they're not, they're not teaching IMS. So anyway, who for thought? But IMS is a, is a hierarchical database. And you can think about the file structure uh, in Windows. So you have a folder, and then you have subfolders in that folder. Um, and then you have a root folder, right? So the IMS um, data structure is the same. You got root. Um, think about it, uh, an upside down tree where the roots at the top and the leaves are um, emanate from the root. Right? And at the end, each one of those leaves is a piece of data. Um, so there are four types of messages. And um, I don't know to the degree the book goes into detail about this, but um, transactions to go to another logical de destination uh, commands for IMS and IMS um, application control feature process. Okay, so we're done with chapter 11. Uh, I didn't think we'll get, get done with that fast. That's good though. Interaction with the computer happens online through the help of a transaction manager. And again, there's a chapter 11. Um, um, well, you can I, I, see, I think I, I, I duplicated chapter 10 and I call one one of the dupes of chapter 10, chapter 11. But you can just look at this. This, this will be on my eye. So you can look at this over and over again. Um, the continued growth of the Internet has caused many corporations to consider the best ways to make the legacy systems available to use on the Internet. Uh, Kicks in the transactional processing subsystem. Kicks application are traditionally run by submitting a transaction request. Um, information management system consists of three components, the transaction manager, the database manager, and the services that tie them together. That's it. Now, um, we've got a little time left. Um, if you have questions, just send them to the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, do a little more COBOL and go into a little more detail about the COBOL that we're using.
really miss you guys. But um, yeah, I'm trying to get my walking better. Uh, it's not coming on as fast as I would like for it to, but I didn't look too much yesterday. And I'm trying not to fall because you know falling falling is bad. <laughs> falling is bad. So, um, you break a hip and then you got eight weeks of stuff, right? So um, anyway. But can't keep you from getting older. You know, all I can do is keep you from try to keep you from getting ill. But I've been off red meat for going on a month now, and I feel great. Lost some weight, and I feel great. Uh, red meat ain't no good for you. Right? I was raised up, raised eating red. It's no good for you. And many of you have already learned that. Uh, I, I'm 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 believing that. I'm I'm off red meat forever. Um. So. So you have the one to, that you're going to do, right? That's real simple. And we're going to give you something a little more uh, involved. Probably two more, right? Probably two more COBOL labs. Uh, but I'll explain to you. And I want to make sure this was on here. Um, but you guys are doing well. You guys are doing well. Oh, a couple of you asked me for... Uh, a video for the JCL lab too. Uh, is, is there a video for the JCL lab? No, there isn't. Shouldn't need one. There's nothing in JCL lab too that you haven't done at least a couple of times this semester. So there is not a lab. I'm not helping you by holding your hand through everything. Sometimes you got to figure stuff out. And most of you did. Most of you, most of you figured out. I really like the people that, that just sent in the two screenshots of, of the data set. That, that was very clever. Because um, I can't argue that they didn't do, I mean, I know for a fact that those data sets weren't there. So they had to go through the sets to create, through the steps to create the data sets. So that was very clever. You got to be pretty smart when you want to be. When you want to be. Okay. Um, I always forget which one of these I want to look at. That's not it. But we're going to do this one. Uh, source code one. No. Um, I know it's in here. I think it is anyway. I think this is it. Yeah, okay, so as I said before, looking at the clock, we got seven minutes. Um, glad you guys showed up, by the way. Now, a couple of you are, are out doing uh, the research thing, research presentation. Uh, well done, well done. Um, I see Dante's hands raised. Dante, is your hands raised for, hand raised for a, a reason, or did I just not? Did I just not lower it? Well, anyway, um, this is a job that has source code in it. Okay, this is a job that has source code. In it. We talked about it before. But um, this is going to be your second one. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to the bottom of this file. And you're going to add some information. You're going to add your information, whatever you want. Your name, um, yeah. You add your name to the bottom of this file, right? And then you're going to run it. So what I what I encourage you to do is see if you can figure out what's going on with this, right? Um, it's not this is not a real complicated program, but um, you, you open mainline. So this is like the main module, and you open the input files. Um, um, you open the input output files. So first thing you do, open your files, and then you read some input in, and you print the header. Then you loop, then you do your processing. 
then you close the files, then you stop the run. So that's what you do. Um, so let's see what 2000 read input does. So yeah, all you're doing is you're reading your input. So it's reading records um, into a buffer. It's called a record set. Reading records into a record set. And it knows when it's at the end of it. So you move one to end of file I. And there's some tests. You see up here that the loop says perform 1500 loop. And you, you 1500 loops is performed. Um, print the name, you perform 1600. So you, what you do is you need to just go look at the modules. Follow the logic of this program. It is very, the logic is very simple. Right? What it's doing is very simple. And uh, because I'm going to be asking you to make some modifications to the um, formatting in another file. Right? In another file. And so what you will do is you will, and please don't ask me how you add a line. Don't ask me that. This is 14, 13 to 14 week of class, 12th or 13th week of class. I think I already did this. Okay. And you see I capped it. Um, I'm going to submit this. No error with the job. What's the job number? 63. No, it ran. And uh, what I didn't ask you to do was put it in your, um, put it in your um, the, the data set. But now I'm going to ask you to do that. So we're going to put in XDC, XDC here. And this will probably be due a week from Sunday. Um, I'm going to put it in the same. Well. Uh, And go look at the output. Yeah, that'll be a nice test for you. Show you how to do some data management. So that's that. Um, now, probably going to have you, and I think I can show you this. I'm not going to compile this, but I'm going to show you what else we're going to do. Um, so there are going to be others in here, and the ones that, that I went to before that. So what you're going to do here is you're going to take this file. going to take this file and this is going to be the compile and what you're going to do is you're going to take this source code and compile it with the file that I just saw and the data you're going to use the data that you're going to use is going to be in, in the data that you're going to use is going to be in this file, right? And then there's there's, there's more complicated versions where we do some some some. Um, um, I may have to do that next, right? That's the version of that. But then there's another one. And I think this is on here. I think this is on here. Uh, yeah, so this one, yeah, this is this. 
Yeah. So I mean, it's not gonna be hard, but it, it, you gotta you gotta pay attention to what you're doing. And so if I ran this, I don't have time to run it today. I, I'm not gonna keep you guys over over 450. But um, um, I, when you run this, you'll see the output of it, and it it, it does some calculations. Pretty cool, actually. And I actually go in here and, and change the years and stuff, find out where the year is. And you got to go in here and look at this. You got to count bytes over. Um, and yeah, well, you know, hopefully we'll have enough time to get to that. Uh, and at least you can say you know how to manage COBOL if, if you don't know, you know, you don't have experience with it, you know how to manage it. Um, let me quickly ask for questions. Um, let me look at my chat. So I, Sure, yeah. Um, good. So um, the fee is at the uh, at the uh, undergrad research event. So that 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 seems like it's a big deal. Um, are there any questions before I leave? If you have any questions, just type them in the chat. Okay. Um, Norfolk Southern Wednesday coming up. They're looking to hire people. They're looking to hire people. I should say no more. Uh, you guys are very blessed that all these companies want to want to talk to you. And it ain't me, it's you. I mean, I, I refuse to take credit for this because you guys are doing it. Um, you're getting jobs and you're doing the, you're doing the work. Um, and then the uh, exam three Friday. Okay. Um, I'll see you. And I'll post this when it's when it's done. Uh, it has to um, finish formatting, but I'll I'll post the uh, post the link. Um, be well until we meet again. Miss you guys.